having that understanding that you need to be consistent at it, although that you know you, you don't see immediate results, but you will get them eventually and be in a, in a better place. That is a tough sell because people want sort of instant gratification. And the same goes for running. Hello and welcome to Run the Business, the podcast that explores the place where running and leadership come together. We'll find out how running can help us with leading, managing people, and generally being better in business. We'll also try and answer that question, do runners make better leaders? I'm Anthony Gay, and today I'm joined by someone who's built a business out of helping others in leadership. He's completed several marathons and even a 100-mile race, and we'll be sharing some of the thoughts he's had about the similarities he sees between outstanding leadership and running. Martin Eleman Olsen, welcome to Run the Business. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. How are you today, Martin? I'm good. I'm very good. How are you? Yeah, good, good. And tell us whereabouts in the world you are first. I live in a smaller town called Vidor near Copenhagen. So I'm in Denmark, near the capital of Copenhagen. Fantastic part of the world. Uh, when did you last go running? Um, I knew you were going to ask this question. My last run was actually yesterday. Uh, so I did a 10 kilometer easy run. Uh, this morning I was at the gym. Gym. I'm getting a. I'm getting a little bit older to so to be able to do the running that I want to do. I, I have to go to the gym, unfortunately. So. Mm-hmm. It happens to us all. And do, do you find the recovery times a, a, a little bit longer uh, that you put in between the, the the workouts? Yeah, I think so. So I'm running five days a week, and I think that's my my maximum. If I try to do any more than that, uh, I'll I'll just get injured. So mm-hmm. that's sort of my maximum at the moment. So to begin with, tell us a little bit about uh, your business, 21 Leadership, and and how that came about and how uh, the business side of your life has evolved first. Yeah, so I've I've been part of a number of large organizations, been a middle manager, also was a senior manager with 80 people in my span of care. And I was part of the senior manager group and I was doing a transformation. At that time, we called it an agile transformation, sort of from the inside. So... You can say I started as a project manager and every time I was promoted, the sort of ripple effect on the organization started to expand. So larger and larger part of the organization started to work uh, this way. And then what happens in many businesses, at some point you have a new strategy, so you have a new free year strategy where you're going to focus on other stuff. And I was just so much into the new ways of working and, and the agile and this stuff that I decided that it was time for me to move on and start my own business and help other organizations go through the same uh, process that I had gone through over those seven years. Uh, so, so that's how it started. So sort of, you know, being on the inside and being part of it and now having the, the I would say, much easier task of being on the outside and advising. And give us a, can you, or can you give us a flavor of the kind of businesses that you work with, the kind of people, are, are they, uh, you know, in Scandinavia or around the world? What, what sort of sectors are they in? There are some international uh, organizations uh, also, but most of them are headquartered or based in Denmark. It's it's actually a large variety of organizations. Previously, I think maybe 10 or 20 years ago, Agile was all about IT. And now sort of the uh, the, the mindset of new ways of working is penetrating almost every industry, I would say. So, so there's, it's, it's not just IT people or one industry, it's, it's across industry that I think leaders and organizations are struggling to find ways of dealing with all the complexity that, is, uh, that we're experiencing around us. And what are your thoughts on the post-COVID world that we're in now and the remote working and the way businesses are, are structured and, and lead across uh, you know, different uh, territories remotely. How, how how does that sort of fit into your thinking and, and the way you work with 21 Leadership? I think we sort of assumed that everyone was equipped uh, or had the skills to project manage their own lives. Uh, and I think we found out during the pandemic that that was actually not the case. So in order to work in a more uh, distributed way, asynchronously, you you actually have to be a pretty good uh, project manager. So I think that's one of the skills that that we sort of learned the hard way that uh, employees, even though they're not in a formal leadership position, they actually need to have some skills in, you, you could say, sort of project management skill, not leading a project, but leading themselves and making sure that they get the stuff done and they are able to involve the colleagues at the right time and so on, reaching out. So I think it's sort of the pandemic was you could say some of the stuff that I'm doing uh, came to the forefront uh, and, and was almost a necessity to uh, to start embracing. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. 
And when did when did running become something in your life? Is is it always been there? I grew up with team sports, so I played the usual soccer, uh, living in Denmark, handball, stuff like that, basketball. I, I, I think I switched and tried almost every uh, sport you can imagine under the sun. So I, I think it was, you know, the classic getting out of university, starting working, being a dad, adding a few kilos <laughs> almost, and then uh, then picking up running and, and starting to be serious about 20 years ago, I would say. Mm-hmm. And was there a point that you can remember where you thought to yourself, oh, I, I, I'm a runner now, this this is what I do, or, or did it sort of gradually creep up on you? I think it was gradually. I definitely, I ran my first marathon in 2000, and I definitely felt like an imposter standing on on the start line and even almost also on the on the finish line of the, the marathon. So it took some time before I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm not the fastest guy in the field, so it, it, it took some time to see myself as a as a, as a runner. And that first run that you just mentioned then, where, where was that? What sort of distance was that? I think I entered a half marathon and a 5K and a 10K, so so sort of the progression of of those distances. But the goal was always to run a marathon. I was, I was fascinated by that, uh, that distance. And to be honest, I think I did it a little bit uh, too quickly. So, so it was... It was more like an extrinsic motivation, and that has definitely shifted over the years, but it was more about getting it done and getting the medal and telling people that I'd done a marathon, that it was uh, that it was something that did sort of intrinsically motivated, if that makes sense. Mm. And that sort of brings us to a piece you wrote about leadership lessons from, from running, because you did a 100-mile run, uh, which was pretty epic and you pulled out a number of points you you reflected didn't you on after you'd done that around the run and what takeaways uh, what impact it could have on on leadership and management and I'd love to if if you're good for it I'd love to go, sort of go through that and dig into that in a bit more detail because the first one was around your why and what you what you're doing it for wasn't it yeah so I think that ties back to the discussion we just had about uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. I have interviewed more than 200 leaders over the years, and I found that 25% of them actually has a, a why, you know, sort of why are they a leader based on uh, core values uh, and, and principles. And I've, I think with the change that we experience around us, uh, the complexity and all the stuff that's going on. I think you make a better leader if you are if you sort of do that work of figuring out why are you a leader, uh, not only why you're leading in that particular organization, but why you as a per- person in a leadership position. And that was one of my reflections, that the same goes for running 100 miles, because if you only do it for the, the belt buckle that you get in the, the US or the middle, you know, you're not very likely to, uh, to succeed because there's, there's so many challenges uh, along the way. So you really need to have that clear why of uh, why you want to do something that most people think is uh, absolutely insane, right? And uh, we need to sort of set some context around where this run was because it, was it was in the US, wasn't it, that you did the 100 miles? Yeah. So it was in the state of Illinois, and it was the Hennepin uh, 100. G- give us a sort of, you know, give us a taste of what that that run is like. I mean, how many people are doing it? What's the terrain? Um, you know, paint the picture for us about, you know, that that day that that took place. Yeah, so it's uh, it's along a canal called the Hen- Hennepin uh, Canal. So it's actually a fairly flat run, and I, I picked it for that reason also. But you're also in uh, quite remote areas, so especially during the nights when you're running in the, in the dark, there's a lot of time where you are out there on your own or maybe only see uh, one or two, uh, two other runners. So you really have to be, be comfortable running around in uh, almost pitch dark only with your, your headlamp to, uh, to, to guide you. There was 330 participants, as I remember. And over that distance, those are scattered out uh, on the course fairly quickly. So you, you do a lot of running by yourself, or at least I did. And it was because it's it's relatively recent, isn't it? It was last year, last um, October that you did this. Yeah, it was it was October uh, October the beginning of October last year. Yeah. And what was the temperature like? And well, you know, was it you know, presumably at that time of year it was pretty dark as well, was it for for quite a lot of it? It was very dark, especially if you live in the city. It was very dark in the, during the nights. It was pretty cold uh, at night, and it was it was fairly warm. It was it was actually quite warm during the day. So I, I think we were quite lucky with the weather. There was no rain or 
you know, no storm or something like that. So, so it was actually quite good weather. But you definitely need to to layer up for the night because it 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 did become quite uh, quite cold during the during the night. And what was your why for doing this? You know, what what was your reason behind this run? I think for me it has it. So my why of running has has changed from being this uh, you know extrinsic motivation, being able to say that oh I did a marathon, I did whatever uh, I've done. To be more about the the journey and exploring my my own uh, limitations, but also you know figuring out how do I react in those situations where you're under extreme uh, stress. So you know you you get sort of the the best and the worst of uh, of yourself and and being comfortable with that. So it's to me it's much more exploring what are the limits and how do I react as a as a person to those challenges that it is about a time or or middle or finish line for that matter. And this run that you did last year, it wasn't the first time you'd attempted this distance, was it? Because you'd, you'd had a go previously, am I right? And 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 hadn't hadn't made it. So so this was something you you kept coming back to. Yeah, I had I had a, an attempt actually earlier that year in September. So I did a fairly short turnaround of only uh, three weeks. I. DNF after a hundred kilometers. I had a problem with my leg that I just wasn't Ill, able to uh, to solve. And then I also attempted another hundred miles the year before, and I DNF at a hundred and thirty five. So I was really close. Um, and that's part of why I, ref- why I started reflecting on this because the first time I didn't have any injuries. It was it was purely in my head. Um, so if that hadn't been the first one, I'm sure I would have. Been able to uh, to complete it, but I was just not in the mentally prepared to actually uh, complete it the first time around. Unfortunately, and and that was one again. What coming back to your reflections of of you know leadership lessons from running, owning mistakes and learning was was your sort of second point, wasn't it? Yeah. So it, it would have been fairly easy to to blame uh, blame others for for me not succeeding the first two two times around. But I don't think I would have learned a lot from that. So I have a great family that is very supportive of my running. Uh, they, they drove around to every aid station and, you know, helped me in, in every way possible. And that's also one of my points. It, it's, it, you know, if you go together, so it, and, and, you know, not only do the journey for yourself by yourself, but can include others in your in your journey. And I think that goes both for running and leadership. You will be much more satisfied when you actually reach your goal. So yeah, owning those two experiences and and really you know doubling down on what could I do differently. And the key point for me was this mental preparation uh, because I don't think it was physical. And do you think you know switching to the people that you work with in business and, and the leadership work that you do? How can you identify that preparation? What what can people listening to this do to be better prepared in their business lives? Well, I work under the assumption that people are motivated to do their best at work. So, so that is sort of my my, my default until uh, proven otherwise. Mm. So, if if the people that you're leading are not performing, I think you should start looking at the direction that you are that you're sending them in. Are you inspired, inspiring them with a vision that that you as a leader is responsible for, and do they have the right conditions to actually uh, do the do the work right. So if if you own that, I, th- I think you can make a quite a big impact, right? On looking at you know, do they have the information they need, the tools they need? Are they on the right teams to actually be able to do the job that you expect them to do? Instead of blaming them for not succeeding, right? The, the third point that you touched upon was around consistency and small steps and uh, it, it, things taking time. I, I kind of want to. Talk about that for a second as well, because there, there's a feeling, or I get a sense in the time that we're in now that that people want stuff so quickly and want to get somewhere quickly, and and the, it's not about the journey. It's just I want it now, uh, and that attitude seems to be there more and more these days. I, I sense that anyway. What what's your take on that, and how how does running help you? You know, help people sort of you know calm that and and be less impatient. I think you're right, and I think when you are trying to change uh, people's uh, uh, adopt a new mindset, you're not trying to change people's mindset. But when you're adopting a new mindset and trying to work in, in more of an experiment and learn manner, uh, deliver value continuously, 
making stuff transparent, having different dialogues and stuff like that. So when you're really trying to go from a sort of traditional hierarchical way of leading, having people in your span of control to thinking about people in your span of care, it's going to take some time before you actually see these uh, results, right? So there'll be a temporary loss in productivity before you sort of reach a, a higher level. And having that understanding that you need to be consistent at it, although that you know you, you don't see immediate results, but you will uh, you will get them eventually and be in a, in a better place. That is a tough sell. I totally agree with you because people want sort of a, a instant gratification, right? Mm-hmm. And the same goes for running. If you want to make it part of your lifestyle and be really uh, good at it or conquer these very long distances, uh, I think the most important key is actually being consistent about it. Do you have any you know, tips, any habits that, or ways to get those habits into our lives that, that are worth sharing? Is it Because it's, it's one of those things that's easier said than done, isn't it? That, that consistency and just you know, doing those things on a regular basis. Yeah. Are there any ways you help people reach that place? From a running her business perspective, I, I guess both. I mean, wait, wait, maybe when you're talking with leaders, and and are there any structures and things that, that you, you kind of help them put in place to to, to make sure that consistency is there? So, so there are some different uh, frameworks, and that's maybe a bit too detailed for this discussion. Uh, but I think sort of adopting a mindset of uh, good enough and now safe enough to try. And I often talk to them about the decisions that they make. Are they reversible or irreversible uh, decisions? And I think. As leaders, we you know we treat a lot of decisions as irreversible decisions, almost like the most important decisions we're going to to make in our lifetime, almost right to, to sort of really put it up, put it out there. So if if we were to say, you know, this is an experiment, we're, we're not, it, it's not finite. It's an experiment. It's something we can redo, uh, and maybe put a sunset clause on it. I think that makes it easier for people to experiment. Saying we're going to try this for the next three months. And if we don't actively decide to continue doing it, we're going back to the old way. So that creates some safety around. Uh, if it doesn't work, we know we're going back to the old way. And often we'll just continue the way that we have started to do stuff, right? That makes a lot of sense. That idea of, uh, as you say, being able to reverse a, a decision and, and having the you know, the, the strength to kind of move, to go back uh, if, if that's the right thing. And I guess for, for leaders, that's quite hard, isn't it, to, to reverse and to choose a, a route that maybe had been seen as the wrong route earlier on, but actually in, on reflection, maybe that is the right way to go. It's it's tough stuff for leaders to, to make decisions like that. Yeah, it's you have to be vulnerable, right? And you have to be willing to admit that with the knowledge you had at the time, that was not the right uh, experiment. Let's try something else. And I deliberately frame it that way. So not that you were wrong, but with the information you had, you're now able to to make a better decision than you were at the time when you make that decision, right? Yeah, and you mentioned a word, keyword there. I think for me is vulnerable, and and in leadership these days, it does feel like the, a leader that is more open and uh, accepts vulnerability is somebody that his team or her team can relate to more easily. Yeah, totally agree. I see the same. Something else you, you talked about um, in your reflections on the hundred mile run was was around having faith in the unknown. Because when you when you start a a hundred mile run, you don't know what's coming up. You can't, as you said, micromanage uh, all the bits to the finish. So having the overall high level roadmap, but then being able to move and and, and duck and dive along the way is so important, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I see the same in business. So, of course, you need to know where you're going. Uh, that's sometimes a, a, a sort of a mis- misunderstanding of new ways of working that we know we're just experimenting and we don't know where we're going. You, you definitely need to have a vision uh, and know where you're going. But maybe you don't need a detailed plan. Maybe you need a, a forecast. Maybe you need a, a roadmap, as you just said. Uh, and then, you know, put in some structures to uh, uh Reflect and adapt uh, early and often along the journey, so so that you can you can make those changes as you get more information and figure out what is you know the right way to execute on that vision. When you were doing the hundred miles, were there was, was there a point somewhere where you came across a challenge or something happened that that threw you for a moment that you had to practically put this in into place there were so many there were, maybe a, a small funny one was 
somehow the the car that I rented in the US weren't able to charge my my headphones. And I was really looking forward to listening to podcasts uh, during the uh, and maybe an audio book during the, the night. And when I put in my headphone, I realized there was there was no power on them. Uh, and, and that sort of threw me off. And, you know, it, it's to even saying it now out loud. It sounds silly, but if you've already done 80, 90 kilometers, small things like that can uh, can throw you off. Uh, luckily, there was an out and back loop at that point, and there was an aid station. So I actually had them charge my headphones while I did the out and back, and I was able to pick them up again. And then I was able to to listen to an audio book uh, during those dark hours in the night. So, so a little bit of a problem solving on the go, but a little bit of panic when I realized that they were out of power. And... and- Having that sort of ability to to solve those problems and have a positive attitude in solving those problems is so crucial as well, isn't it? Because you also uh, you, you talked about smiling, and I, I know we've talked about this on other podcasts uh, with other guests as well. And just the process of smiling and being happy uh, convinces your body and convinces yourself that you are in a a better place than than you you would be otherwise, doesn't it? Yeah. So I, I think both in leadership and running, if you bring a positive attitude, even though that that you know uh, you're almost running on empty, but if you run into an aid station and bring a positive attitude, you, you you're gonna meet happy people. Uh, and mm. also, even you know, in the dark, out on the trails, uh, smile, and you like you said, convince your body that uh, this is actually fun. It might hurt, but it's actually fun doing this. Yeah. And in terms of the goal uh, that that you have, I mean. There's a lot of people go go running and people feel, maybe people coming to running feel like you're competing against other people. You pointed out quite rightly that actually the only competition is yourself yeah. and you you are challenging you to be a better person. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how that relates to, to leadership? At least in running with Strava and other tools, right? It's it's very easy to get caught up in in segments and comparing yourself to to other runners standing on the start line and thinking, oh, they look fitter than uh, than I do. And and I think the same goes in uh, uh, in leadership. That can be in a in a meeting where people show results and you're envy of what they have accomplished instead of thinking of the the conditions that you have in your leadership and just focusing on trying to. Be the best leader you can in, you know, for the people that are in your span of care, uh, in your position, right? Mm-hmm. And instead of comparing yourself to to other leaders, and you might not fully understand what their uh, conditions are, so that so you know they might have an easier job than you, are, or yeah, they might do things differently, and you can get inspired mm-hmm. and learn from them, but don't compare yourself to them. I see the same on an organizational level when when organizations are introducing these new ways of working. They are also looking at other organizations and saying like, we want what they have. And I always say, copy, don't paste, right? So be inspired, but find your own way of doing stuff. Who inspires you, Martin, in in both leadership and in, and in running? When you know, how would you de- describe your style of of leadership? I, th- I think it's not for me to actually describe my way of. Of, of leading, I, I, I think of, that would be for others to do. Okay. I hope I'm seen as someone who is trying to create leaders at every level of the organization. Um, so, so not uh, regardless of whether people are in sort of a formal uh, managerial position, uh, trying to create leaders, as I said, both leaders of themselves, but also of you know their colleagues and others. That's at least what I'm trying to do. And where do you get your inspiration from and, and your energy from when when you look to the world? Who, who's inspiring you? I read a lot of of books, uh, and there's a lot of people who uh, who inspire me. I would say, sort of close to home, I have a good uh, colleague, Martin Winder. Uh, he often inspires me. And sort of the corny answer would be my wife. Uh, she's much more disciplined than uh, than I am, both in uh, in work and and running. So I, I think she's very uh, uh, grounded, and that's uh, that's that's inspirational. And also, selfishly allowing me to go on some of these adventures because she's got the the bases covered, right? And another one of your points was around going together, wasn't it? And doing, you know, involving the the team, people around you, rather than just seeing uh, leadership as a as a solo uh, obligation. How do you kind of create a culture in business? where the the team 
is uh, is at the centre of, of of the process. How, you know, what what's your uh, approach to that? I, I do a lot of different things, but I think involving the team in making some of the decisions. So putting in decision frameworks could be one example uh, where the team decides how to make different types of uh, decision instead of it always being a a, a leader uh, leadership decisions on certain topics. Uh, is one way. So, you know, experimenting, involving them, co-creating, making a space, safe space for dialogue and listening, and making stuff transparent in the organization are some of the ways to, uh, to, to get people to buy into what they're doing. And I think a big part of leadership, when we talk about more sort of self-led or small uh, distributed teams uh, having autonomy and having a purpose, I think a bit big part of the uh, task of leadership is translating the overall purpose of the organization to something that is inspiring to them, right? And that's also part of, of going together, if that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. And, and it's it's something that it, it feels, again, in the post-COVID sort of space, it's even more important, isn't it, with with people not always being physically together all, all the time, that they have in that independent way that they might be working, they still feel connected to, to the overall purpose. Sort of also, uh, you know, with a, a glimpse in my eye, I say to leaders, don't don't make employees more efficient if they don't know where they're going. They're just going to run fast in different directions. So you really want to, you know, set that direction, but also allow them to find different, uh, different ways of, of getting there. You mentioned, uh, you, you were talking about the battery on your um, listening device uh, for audiobooks and music and stuff. What, what sort of, uh, just give us a, a taster of the kind of things that you've been listening to when you do go on the long runs. I rarely listen to music. I, I primarily listen to uh, to podcasts and books. Uh, actually doing the 100 mile, I, I listened to the book Doing Hard Things by Steve Magnus, I think he's called. So that was actually quite inspirational. And, and he was talking about, we think that Toughness is 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 uh, you know something that people are tough or they're not tough, but actually uh, you need to be vulnerable in order and embrace that discomfort to actually be able to do hard things. So you're sort of trying to to turn the the perception of toughness on its head, and, and that was very inspirational uh, feeling. Very sorry for myself and 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 hurting uh, during that run that I didn't have to be this macho character to actually uh, be able to complete these things. And there's something, isn't there, about those those longer runs when your body is in that fatigued place? Um, the messages that come in and experiences they are, for I think various you know reasons, they're way more powerful, aren't they? The way you accept them and and consume them uh, because of kind of the environment you're in and the condition your body's in. Yeah, I think this is something that echoes some of your previous guests also. But I've made a lot of my Sort of big uh, business decisions on the run and, and you know there's something when you get your pulse racing you almost get those moments of clarity where you know what is the what is the right thing to do any big decisions that, that you can think of that you've made when you've been out running well we were we were building a quite successful company we had uh, 15 uh, people employed in the in the company but it, it just didn't feel right for me so i was a co-founder i was there for seven years and I decided on the run that I wanted to do something different with my working life. So, so I, um, I handed the company off to one of the other uh, co-founders and I founded my new company, 21 Leadership. So, so, you know, it's something that had been nagging me and I've been thinking about and, you know, strategizing around for a while. But sort of that final uh, aha moment, this is, uh, this is a contribution I want to make to the world and this is what I want to do. That came on a run. I love your goal uh, as well uh, to help leaders create organisations where we'd love our kids to work. That's fantastic. How did that come to you? It was a very long process, and it was against. I don't know if that actually came to me on a run, but I've, I've been thinking a lot about it on runs also. I have daughters of fifteen and seventeen, and when they go into the uh, when they go into a workplace, they're going to spend more time there than they were actually spent with their their husband and wife. Uh, so so I, I really want to create an environment where they can be their full self without a facade and be quirky and, you know, have equal opportunities being women and whatever they decide to do. So I, I think that was a process uh, somehow. 
And it's it's also for me, it's also a measure of which clients I want to work with. Um, so if, if I don't see organizations moving in in that direction, so if they are, you know, utilizing employees as resources in a in, in a way that I wouldn't want my kids to be treated, uh, then we have that conversation, and ultimately uh, I fire the client and and find someone else who's uh, who, who has similar goals to me. And there's something, isn't there, about having the strength to make decisions like that? And I appreciate it. You know, some people can't do that because they they may need to, you know, put food on the table. But there is something about aligning your values with the values of the people that surround you and, and the work that you do. Uh, it just it feels to live a better life. It's such an important thing to do, isn't it? To find a way to do it. Yeah, I totally agree. I see a balanced life like a you know free legged uh, chair, uh, so to speak. So there are the you know the relationships, uh, both those close to you, your family, your friends, uh, your working relationships. There's your work. So what's the purpose of what you're doing? And then there's you. So that's the the, the third leg, taking care of yourself, uh, making sure that you know uh, you eat healthy food, that you exercise, uh, but also that you have some Martin time or Anthony time, right? That you're actually able to go on these adventures or whatever it is that uh, that actually uh, makes you happy. And and there needs to be a balance that, that aligns with your value. Gratitude was, I think, the final of, of the reflections of the long run that, that you came came up with uh, and being able to reflect on uh, and be grateful for, for things that are happening in, in life and the people around you. How do you do that on a day-to-day basis? Can is Do you have any sort of structures and processes for giving gratitude or is it is it now just a natural part of who you are? I think it comes fairly naturally. Uh, maybe my wife would say that I need to to be better at it, uh, and I'm taking <laughs> her sometimes for granted. I remind myself also in leadership that you know you, you don't get to any leadership position without uh, followership from uh, from from people along the way. Um, you simply can't do it on your own. And the same goes for running 100 miles if you want to have that balance in your life. Maybe you could do it and then not have that balance. But being able to juggling all the things that, uh, that, that you need to do with work uh, obligations and family and so on, um, you simply can't do it on your own. And you need to remember to, to be grateful. I also try to do it uh, in, you know, I had a great workshop yesterday with a young female leader, and I wrote her email this morning, and you know, say great work, and that was a, that was a really good workshop, and you know, just remember doing those small things. I think goes a long way. Yeah, it's, it's those small, tiny things that only take ten seconds, a minute, whatever. It can have a huge impact, can't it, on on the people around you, and that snowball effect can can be really powerful. Yeah, and, and you know, we will let people know if it didn't go well, mm. right? You know, they will certainly know. So why not let them know when it when it's actually a success, when it goes well? Martin, running aside, is there a, a business tool, an app, a person, maybe something that you couldn't do without? Well, it's a small app, uh, but I think uh, Calendly, uh, so which allows people to look directly uh, into my calendar, book me, and I can set rules around transportation time and, and stuff like that has really been a game changer uh, working with uh, multiple leaders and, and organizations at the same time it, it was just a hassle sending out emails you know i can i have time here here and here and you know the drill right and then someone else books you so so you know giving them access to my calendar creating that transparency is is, is, is saved me a lot of uh, time on stuff that i don't really enjoy to be honest and business aside what's, what's your favorite bit of running kit or accessory that you can't do with that. Yeah, I think it has to be a combination of the stride foot pot, uh, which sort of measures. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of a, a geek when it comes to uh, to running. Uh, so it measures, measures your your wattage, just like you would do in, uh, like you know, in cycling. Combined with my uh, Garmin uh, watch, I have the Apex Two with the the nice screen, and I can see the data from my foot pot, and I know exactly how many wattage I'm uh, I'm producing. So so a combination of those two would be okay would be it. How did you feel at the end of your 100 mile run? And will you be doing another one? Uh, Tired and a sense of happiness that an accomplishment that is, uh, that is rare. And that's, you know, that's a danger, right? Now I have to go even further to have that sensation. And I was lucky enough, it was a 
I think it was five o'clock in the morning in the in the US. So it was afternoon in Denmark. And for the last I think kilometer and a half, my family was on FaceTime and I was yeah, um, telling them how grateful I was for the support. Uh, and they crossed the finish line uh, together with me. So they couldn't be there in person. They were there for the two <laughs> two times I DNF'd, unfortunately. But you know, sitting down in that chair, getting the belt buckle and being able to share that with my family and showing them that buckle uh, that was as much theirs as, as it is mine. Uh, that, that, that was, uh, I'll, I'll never forget it, to be, uh, to be honest. I like to experiment. So your second question, I like to experiment with my running. So my next race will actually be the London Marathon. Uh, so I haven't, uh, I haven't done that one and I heard so many wonderful things about it. So I'm going to focus a, a little bit more on running a decent marathon and then we'll see in the future uh, if I'm going to go really long again. I'm, think, I probably will, <laughs> to be honest. Do you think your goals in life, both in running and in business, have you noticed them change over time? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that's quite natural. When you're young, it's it's uh, it's more about the, you know, the position and the status and the money and, and what you can buy. And now it's much more about wholeness and relationships and the people around me and the longevity instead of this uh, uh, instant gratification that we also talked about earlier. So yeah, uh, more intrinsic and, and, and less intrinsic. Money just isn't as important as it once was, to be honest. Martin, let's leave it there. I mean, a, a fantastic, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. If people want to find out about 21 Leadership, I'll make sure the details are in the in the show notes. And I, I want to just mention that goal again of, of your business, to help leaders create organisations where we'd love our kids to work. That's so powerful. And it's been great catching up. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me on. Again, thanks to Martin for his time on Run the Business this week. More on his business at 21leadership.com. That's the numbers 21leadership.com. Got to say, I loved his story of the Hennepin 100. The fact that he had to come back for a third time to complete it says so much about the kind of person that Martin is. And I loved how he brought his family into that final stretch. Uh, what a picture that painted in my mind. In terms of takeaways from that conversation, well, Martin's nine leadership lessons from running 100 miles is probably the best summary, really. And these are the nine. These are all Martin's thoughts, by the way. Uh, the first one was know your why. Uh, if you only do it for the glory, you're unlikely to succeed. And that's true for both ultra running and leadership. Uh, he meets many leaders who don't know why they lead. Uh, why do you want to lead? Why, why are are you in business? What are you there for? Uh, the second one was uh, owning mistakes and learning from them. If the outcome is not as you imagined or expected, you need to own it and learn from it. When he dropped out of his first 100 mile attempt, he could easily have blamed it on the hills, the weather, other exterior factors. In reality, Martin knew he was unprepared and acknowledged that uh, and acknowledging that allowed him to own the situation and learn from it. And the same is true for leadership, even if you feel you are without fault or even a victim of a given situation. Uh, if you try and own your stake in what went wrong and be relentless in what you can learn from it, that's only going to help you raise your game. The third thing that Martin flagged was consistency and small steps. We've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Becoming a great leader or getting into shape for running it takes time, it takes effort, it takes dedication. Progress is often shown in small incremental steps with, as he describes, irritating setbacks to overcome along the way. It has to be something you just get used to. Uh, the fourth thing he picked up was having faith in the unknown. Uh, you cannot micromanage your way to the finish line of a 100 mile race. Working from a high level roadmap and being comfortable with the unknowns that will happen during training and racing will only increase your likelihood of success. And Martin points out the same is true for leadership. The, the world is too complex and volatile to plan everything up front. Unforeseen stuff will happen and being comfortable with the fact that you cannot predict everything will give you more mental bandwidth to focus on the knowns. Life is messy, isn't it? And uh, how we handle that messiness is, is, is part of the journey. Uh, the... 
Fifth thing that Martin flagged was bringing a positive as attitude. It's an easy one, but smiling while running can reduce pain. It's been proven and make running feel easier. A positive attitude to leadership and occasionally smiling, enjoying it, can also have a positive effect. The sixth point was about racing yourself. Uh, it's easy to compare yourself to others in running, leadership, life in general. But why? Martin knows he's never going to be the fastest runner or maybe even the best leader for that matter. But that's not why he does it. Running is something he does for himself. And, and what is the definition of best anyway? Uh, the seventh point was being an expert in problem solving. Again, something we've talked about a lot on the podcast. Uh, whether it's cramping, gut issues, bad weather, blisters lack of motivation, just some of the problems you risk running into when running long distances. The list of issues you'll face in leadership is much, much longer. So being an expert problem solver combined with that pro positive attitude will increase your likelihood of success. And, and, and I add relishing solving problems. It's part of what leaders do. It's probably the biggest thing that leaders do. So relish when the problems come along and you need to solve them. The eighth point he flagged was about going together. Uh, running and leadership can sometimes feel lonely, but doing it with others can make it easier and more fun. You might run with a group or share your leadership obli obligations with others. But even if you run or lead alone, you don't have to be alone. Having a support system that understands why you do it and the consequences it has can be a blessing when the going gets tough. And the ninth point he made was about being grateful. Uh, gratitude, giving gratitude. Nearing the finish line of that race, he started to reflect on how grateful he was to be able to complete this long-term goal of his. He felt grateful for the support of his family, the flexibility of his working situation that allowed him to be there, his health, the race organizers, the volunteers for putting on the race, and all the people that had shaped and inspired him on his journey. When you succeed in running, when you succeed in leadership or any aspect in life, remember those who supported you on the journey. Run the Business is a real two media production. If you're not already doing so, please follow the podcast. It really, really does make a difference. Uh, download it, comment and share. If you're enjoying it, get in touch as well. It's lovely to hear from you. I'm Anthony Gay and until next time, happy running and keep chasing your goals.